Hey everyone, and welcome. Today, we're tackling a huge concept in economics, one that honestly trips up a lot of people, market failure. We're not just gonna define it, we're gonna show you how to break it down and explain it like an absolute pro. This is your masterclass. So we've all heard about Adam Smith's invisible hand, right? This beautiful idea that the market, left to its own devices, just sorts everything out for the best. But what happens when that hand isn't so steady? What if it fumbles or just completely malfunctions? Well, that's exactly what market failure is all about. All right, here's our game plan. First, we'll get a handle on what a market malfunction actually is. Then, we'll dive into the four big reasons it happens. We'll look at whether the government can swoop in and save the day. And then, and this is the important part, we'll get super practical, showing you how to build the perfect answer for an exam, how it gets graded, and finally, where you can go to learn even more. Okay, let's start with a really helpful way to think about this. Imagine the free market is this incredible, perfectly designed robot. It's one job, to allocate all of our resources in the most efficient way possible. It's self-guiding, it's smart, but what happens when that perfect robot breaks down? This is the official definition. It's when our robot starts glitching. It's no longer making the best choices for society as a whole. Instead of efficiently distributing resources, it's creating waste, or maybe it's not producing enough of the stuff we actually need. The bottom line is the outcome isn't optimal and social well-being takes a hit. Now, before we really get into all the ways the robot can break, you kind of have to know what it looks like when it's working perfectly, right? If you want a fantastic deep dive on that, go check out Chapter 7 of Mankiw's Principles of Economics. It's all about market efficiency and sets the stage for everything we're about to talk about. Okay, so our robot is sparking and smoking on the factory floor. It's time to put on our mechanics hat and diagnose the problem. It turns out there are usually four main glitches that cause this kind of breakdown. Let's look at each one. First up, we've got externalities. You can think of these as economic side effects. A buyer and a seller make a deal, but someone else, a third party who had nothing to do with it, ends up feeling the impact either good or bad, and that impact isn't reflected in the price. And these side effects come in two flavors. You've got your negative externalities, like a factory polluting a river. The cost of that pollution isn't paid by the factory, so the market ends up making way too much of whatever that factory produces. On the flip side, you have positive externalities. Think of a beekeeper whose bees also pollinate the apple orchard next door. The orchard owner gets that benefit for free. Because the beekeeper isn't paid for that extra value, the market ends up with too few bees. Glitch number two is the problem of public goods. Now, these are things with two very specific properties that just mess with the market. First, they're non-excludable, meaning you can't stop anyone from using them. And second, they're non-rivalrous, which means one person using it doesn't stop another person from using it. This combination is a real puzzle for a profit-driven market. The classic example here is a lighthouse. I mean, think about it. You can't put a toll booth on a beam of light, right? You can't stop ships from using it. So if you're a private company, why would you ever build one? You can't make any money. People will just wait for someone else to build it and then use it for free. That's called the free rider problem, and it's why the market on its own just won't provide these kinds of goods. Our third glitch is market power. This is what happens when one company, or maybe a tiny group of them, gets way too much control. Think of a monopoly. Suddenly, our efficient market robot isn't working for everyone anymore. It's just working for the monopolist. And what does that mean for us? Higher prices and less output than what society really wants. And the fourth and final core failure is something called asymmetric information. It's just a fancy term for a lopsided deal where one person knows a whole lot more than the other. The classic case is the used car salesman who knows the car he's selling you is a total lemon, but you don't. When one side of the transaction is working with incomplete or bad information, the market just can't produce an efficient outcome. So our robot is broken in one of these four ways. It's a mess. Who do you call? Well, in economics, the answer is often the government. They're supposed to be the mechanic that comes in, diagnoses the specific glitch, and tries to fix it. And a good mechanic always uses the right tool for the right problem. If the problem is a negative externality like pollution, the government can use something called a Pigovian tax to make polluters pay. If it's a public good like a lighthouse, they can just provide it directly. If a company has too much market power, they can use antitrust laws to break it up or regulate it. And if the issue is asymmetric information, they can create rules that mandate transparency, like lemon laws for used cars. All right, let's switch gears. Knowing all this stuff is great, but the real test is being able to explain it clearly and effectively, especially on an exam. 
So let's build the perfect A plus answer step by step. This is the how to part of the masterclass. It's actually a pretty simple formula. First, start with a crisp, clear definition of market failure. Second, list and explain the different reasons it happens, those four failures we just talked about. Third, make sure you talk about the government's role. Don't just leave it hanging. Fourth, and this is the secret sauce, explicitly match the government solutions to the specific problems. And finally, say everything you need to say, but keep it concise, no rambling. Let me say that again, because this is literally the most important piece of advice. This is what separates a good answer from a great one. Don't just have a list of problems and a separate list of solutions. You have to build the bridge between them. Say, to solve the problem of negative externalities, governments can use Pigovian taxes. That direct link is pure gold. Okay, let's peek behind the curtain. If you want to get the best score, you need to think like the person who's greeting your answer. What are they looking for? What makes them put a big check mark next to your response? So you're aiming for that top tier, the 8 to 10 point range. You want an answer that really shines. Here's what an excellent answer looks like. It identifies at least three, maybe all four, of the core failures we discussed. But more importantly, it nails that connection we just talked about. It clearly and specifically links each failure to a corresponding government policy. That shows a deep level of understanding. Now, what about an average score, something in the four to five point range? What does that look like? And what are the common mistakes that land people here? An average answer usually just scratches the surface. It might only identify one or two reasons for market failure, and the explanation is probably a bit weak. But the biggest giveaway is a vague mention of the government's role. Something like, and the government can intervene. It doesn't say how. It doesn't make that crucial link. That's the trap to avoid. So now you have a really solid foundation. You know what market failure is, why it happens, and how to explain it. But if you're curious and you want to go even deeper, here are a few cool places to explore next. You could check out the Coase Theorem, which asks a fascinating question. Maybe private individuals can solve externalities on their own without the government. You could also look up the two-by-two two matrix of goods, which is a great tool for classifying all goods into four types— and then, for a real twist, you can explore the idea of government failure. And that's really the perfect question to end on. We've spent this whole time talking about the government as the mechanic who fixes the broken market. But what if the mechanic is clumsy? What if the solution they come up with actually creates a whole new set of problems, maybe even worse than the original one? That's a whole other topic, but it's a crucial piece of the puzzle to keep in mind.